Hi. What exactly is high functioning autism? It's not a question that would usually pass my lips or that I'd normally be in a hurry to answer, but today we're doing things a little bit differently. I'm Quinn and I'm autistic. And that's all I would usually say, unless specifically asked. I rarely feel it necessary to qualify it and I never couch it in functioning terms. But I do get told I'm high functioning quite regularly and not just in the comments of these videos. In fact, when someone finds out that I have an autism diagnosis, it's one of the first observations most people make. So let's take all that at face value today and say they're right and that I represent a fairly typical high functioning autistic, at least in their eyes. Today on Autistomatic, I want to ask if I'm a good example, what does high functioning autism look like? Humour me a little, would you? I'd like you to have a little think about what qualities single someone out as a high-functioning autist. It's not a medical term. Never has been. It popped up in the early 20th century as a euphemism for drunks that could hold their liquor. And after 60 years of people playing cultural telephone games, it found its way into a couple of autism papers in the late 1980s. It has no agreed parameters, no diagnostic criteria, and most responsible diagnosticians rarely use it. Unless, of course, they think it's clinically beneficial for them to serve their patient's diagnosis up with a spoonful of metaphorical sugar. So, what it means is entirely up to you. I don't describe myself as high-functioning. Other people do. So, as one of those other people, yourself, it's what you think now that matters. When I was first diagnosed as autistic, the autism spectrum we all know today was still just a radical new theory, some years away from being formally adopted worldwide. I went to regular schools. I've worked full-time or self-employed all my life, largely in public-facing roles. I'm happily married. I have pets. I drive a car, play video games, I fix things for fun, I bake a mean chocolate cake, love a good conversation, and I run a YouTube channel. Nothing remarkable or worth crowing about, but they are all things I've been told I'm only able to do because I'm so very obviously extremely high functioning. Now, You'll often hear us autists pointing out that most of us mask ourselves to fit in. So the only version of us that other people usually see is our on-duty face. The one which is putting in a massive effort to replicate all the little idiosyncrasies people expect for us to be allowed through the gates reserved for normal people. You don't get to see the other side of us so often. <laughs> Even so, if you're like typical person on the street, you probably think we're a bit odd. Kind of difficult to work out. But you won't see the struggle within us. That daily wrestling with other people's expectations, including yours, that keeps us on our toes all day long like frightened meerkats. Being autistic touches on our lives, on my life, in ways most non-autistic people don't know about and certainly won't find in any medical or academic descriptions of autism. <coughs> Being autistic doesn't stop at the headline traits that everybody knows about, or at least thinks they know about. There's lots more to it that you won't know about unless someone like me tells you. Trouble is... A lot of us autistic peeps find it very difficult to explain such things. Things like the digestive problems many of us have. This is one of many things that aren't unique to autistic folks, but they're much more common if you're autistic than if you're not. I have something called gastroparesis, which means my stomach doesn't empty properly, so my food sits there for hours, going nowhere. 
and your stomach fills up real quickly when the drain's blocked. That contributes to my painful and unpleasant acid reflux, again, more common for us on the autistic side of the fence. That not only caused me years of discomfort before it was diagnosed, but also rotted away my back teeth. I'm clumsy as well. I don't quite qualify for a dyspraxia diagnosis, but my gross motor skills, you know, the ones you need for sport and some manual jobs, are terrible. Strangely, my fine motor skills are good enough for me to have made a living with them for a long time. I'm great at fitting tiny screws into microscopic threads, but not so good at banging in nails. Have you ever heard of alexithemia? I've done a few videos about it, which I'll link above. In fact, I've done videos on lots of the topics I'm talking about today. Way more than I can link up there, to be honest. At least half of autistic people are alexithemic, which is medically defined as an inability to connect with the right words to describe how we're feeling. A language thing. But the actual experience for many of us autistic alexithemics is a sudden dip in emotional intensity when feelings rise above a certain point. An emotional glass ceiling, if you like. When emotions run high, ours can vanish all of a sudden. They're still there, bubbling away in the background, sometimes raising our blood pressure and heart rate even, making us sweat or giving us goosebumps. But consciously, cool as a cucumber. It can make us great guys to have a round in a crisis, because we keep it real. But we can also miss out on the highs too. If the mood gets too excited, too elated, too romantic even, we can find ourselves suddenly feeling flat. It doesn't make us popular, and faking it to keep people happy gets tiring quickly, and it backfires big time if we're caught. Then there's the other side of alexithemia. When those emotions that were hidden from us days, weeks, months ago, come back to bite us later, and it's never when we're ready for them. I've cancelled job interviews and bailed on someone's wedding, but I've cheesed off a lot more people by not cancelling. Suddenly becoming overwhelmed with inappropriate grief, fear or outrage, or laughing at completely the wrong moment doesn't make you popular. Enough said. Now, my stomach problems, clumsiness and my alexithemia are also aggravated by my uncalibrated introception. If you don't know what that is, you know your main senses, your sight, hearing, smell, all those? Those senses that tell us about the outside world are our perception. The ones that give us feedback about ourselves, our body's conscious regulatory system, if you like, that's interoception. Most autistic folks have some kind of interoceptive issues, some more than others. My clumsiness is partly down to my proprioception being off. That means my sense of body position and proximity to objects is off kilter. Nothing I can't manage for the most part, though, just by being careful and planning ahead. Not so easy to work around is... I don't get hungry. I mean, hardly ever. I basically switch between two states. Not hungry and ravenous. There's no middle ground. If I think about food and I'm not ready for it, I get intensely nauseous, sometimes physically retching. That usually only lasts for a few minutes, a couple of hours, maybe a few days at worst, but it can go on for longer. That is not something you want on top of gastroparesis and acid reflux. So, on the one hand, I risk starving because I don't get hungry. And on the other, if I stick to a rigid meal plan, I risk putting on weight because I don't know that I'm full until I've way overdone it. The pills I could take that would force my stomach to open disagreed with me even more than the symptoms, and I'm not a suitable candidate for the irreversible surgical option. So it takes a lot of thought and management just to be able to eat. 
interception gets me at the other end too. So I don't get warnings when I need the loo either. You know that terrifying feeling when you realise you ate something dodgy last night and if you don't get to the bathroom right now, you'll be in trouble? That feeling is the only warning I usually get. Maybe at best a couple of minutes of pressure and pain before say no more. On those odd occasions that I've been caught out or held up somewhere and I've had to drop everything and rush to the loo, I've been called antisocial, selfish, lazy, shy. Even unmanly and disloyal have found their way in there. With every new boss, I'd end up ticking toilet complaints from other staff members off my employment cliché bingo card eventually. Funnily enough, I've never received much sympathy when I've tried to explain, but plenty of sniggering afterwards. One thing bosses do love about me, though, is that I don't get tired. Not at work, anyway. I mean, I sometimes turn up half dead from the night before because I didn't sleep. Another common autistic issue, insomnia. Plenty of us have major problems keeping to a sleep cycle. It's not just that lots of us are night owls, because it's all too easy for us to keep ourselves up all night anyway, because that's how monotropism works. Time can lose all meaning when you've gone all autistomatic on something. But my interoception messes with that even, because I don't actually feel fatigue in any meaningful way. I have a slow waking up state in the morning, but once that clears, I'm the same level of alertness all day until I get a very short window in which I feel tired. Like a lot of things on this list, it's a binary state, on or off. No analogue turning up the dial for me. I'm fully awake or I'm dog tired and ready to drop. Of course, when I'm working, I'm almost always in fresh mode and I stay that way all day, even into overtime. But without fatigue to tell me when to stop, I've gone and pushed myself way beyond my limits far too many times and I've paid the price dearly. Last week, I talked about aphantasia. My visual imagination, my ability to picture something in my mind's eye, is basically non-existent. That leads to a lot of awkward questions. Why didn't I get the joke? Why didn't I understand the instructions? Why couldn't I remember that face? And um, where did I leave my specs? My memory is really good in many ways, but visual details? I have to work really hard to recall, and that's got me into so much trouble. People just don't believe me when I tell them I don't remember visual details of something that just happened, or I can't visualise something on the spot, and some folks get nasty about it very quickly. That happens when I fail to recognise them too. I'm prosopagnosic, which means I don't recognise faces easily. Face blindness, as they call it. I do recognise people's faces eventually when I've known them long enough, but it takes me a long time to get to that point where I can recognise someone on sight alone, and it's even more difficult when I meet them somewhere unexpected. My body's temperature regulation is all over the place, something I share with loads of autists. I get horrific migraines, common in autists. I've needed a walking stick to get about since my late 20s because of a spinal condition which is, can you guess? You got it. It's more common in autistic folks. I have an odd kind of dyscalculia that allows me to do maths in my head, but not on paper. I was viciously mocked and punished for it at school and faced accusations of all sorts of incompetence and ill will in the workplace. If something interests me, I learn it with impressive speed and detail. But if it doesn't interest me enough, my brain refuses to cooperate. And that applies to some of those essential life skills too. There are gaps that have always relied on other people to help me manage, because without their help, I wouldn't even be here. My mental health has been up and down all my life. 
forcing me to leave jobs, friends and relationships for self-preservation. Whether people know you're autistic or not, our character traits always seem to end up getting us into trouble. And no matter how much protection we have in law or that we create for ourselves, stuff always hits the fan eventually. We come up against people who dislike us for no obvious reason. Or we don't realise we're being bullied until we're already bottom of the food chain. Or worst of all, we didn't understand some unwritten rule, so we did something unforgivable. We still don't get but we're being punished for it anyway. I react to some drugs differently, of all sorts. Nothing's ever made me feel high, and anaesthesia can be a very hit-and-miss affair with me. Alcohol doesn't make me drunk, only sleepy. I'm not a belligerent drunk, a flirty drunk, or even a woozy, you're my best pal kind of drunk. I'm a dozing drunk. Drugs I've been prescribed have worked in unexpected ways, and on one occasion a few years ago, they even came close to finishing me off. So, there you have it. A little chef's taster menu for you of some of the more significant differences and inconveniences that come with my particular flavour of what some people like to call high-functioning autism. Most of what I've talked about today aren't the core traits of autism. They're all known to be significantly more common amongst autistic folks. They're my winnings from the genetic roulette wheel, and it seems I've got a pretty generous haul of those potential adjuncts to autism that not all of us end up with. I'm far from alone in that, and the thousands of comments on my videos and the messages I've received from other autists remind me of that every day. I'm far from being unusual. In fact, in many ways, I'm quite the ordinary, unremarkable autist, if there is such a thing. I've not really touched on the aspects of my autistic life that I don't usually show the rest of the world. The ones I kept hidden so I didn't get beaten up, bullied and expelled from school or fired from jobs. Of course, my masking obviously isn't as good as I hoped because the stuff I've been talking about kept happening to me. Still does. Now that I've spent a few minutes summing up a few of the lesser talked about aspects of high functioning autistic life, is it what you expected? There will be some people out there now rolling up their sleeves, ready to write oh so very clever comments about severe autism and profound autism, eager to tell me how little I understand, make some glib comments about TikTok and how some kid they know, blah blah blah. But to be fair, to be, fair. to be fair. To be fair. To be fair. People like that rarely bother watching the video before they excrete their opinions onto the screen, so I doubt many have got this far. I'm luckier than a lot of my viewers and friends. The adjuncts to my autism the specifics of my sensory differences and the details of my communication barriers are pretty benign compared to the hand I could have been dealt. I don't have intellectual disabilities, epilepsy or crippling sensory issues, and I can speak and be understood. I still have major gaps in my neurotypical skill set, but they're easier ones to hide than some, so I've had a smooth ride compared to a lot of my friends. I'm not asking for sympathy here. I'm just trying to offer a little clarity. I want to put some real, lived-in flesh on the bones of that concept of high-functioning autism that a small minority insist on flinging around like it means something. If that's what they think I am, then this has been a small taste of what that means. If I truly am an obvious example, then a high-functioning autist is someone who does a pretty good job of hiding the most difficult aspects of being autistic, whilst making their best efforts to make the most of the good bits, but never failing to get caught out by the bits in between. The bits that are a constant source of irritation, of friction and conflict that I dearly love to avoid. Whether you have doubts about anything I've said, or you'd like to delve a bit deeper, 
you might want to dip your toes into the playlist I've linked in the end credits and in the description. It offers further insight into many of the bits and bobs I've mentioned today, and if you like what I'm doing here and can afford to help me keep making videos, this is my livelihood after all, then please consider supporting me on Patreon, and of course, do the old likey subscribey thing too. I've been Quinn, and I've always been autistic, and I thank you for watching. If you've already liked and subscribed and would like to support the channel more, then please follow the Patreon links in the description to pledge what you feel is fair and affordable to help keep the lights on here and the content keep flowing.